Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us, and uh, we are meeting virtually. Uh, I'm here in the Pacific Northwest, and Tom is back in Connecticut, and Glenn is in Michigan. The marvels of the modern world. Anyway, I'm C.R. Wiley, and I'm a pastor, as I noted, in the Pacific Northwest. I've been a professor of philosophy. I've written some books, and enough about me. How about you, Tom? I'm Tom Price. I uh, teach systematic theology, Christian ethics, philosophy, and a host of other things. And pretty much will teach any topic these days. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are plenty I don't want to teach. <laughs> um, I'm That's actually the pickier, pickier the older I get. I imagine I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, but I teach at Gordon Conwell and other places. <laughs> great, great. Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a professor emeritus of history at Central Connecticut State University, senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Um, and I am working, well, uh, on sep- effective September 1st, I will be working uh, with Ken Boa at Reflections Ministries in Atlanta, although I'll be doing it remotely. All right, super stuff. Hey, anyway, it's your show today, Glenn, but I need to take uh, take a little time to talk about a couple of things. One of those things is the Fight, Laugh, Feast Conference. So, folks, if you're on the fence, if you've known about the Fight, Laugh, Feast Conference and, and have been saying it to yourself, really, should I go? Well, the answer is yes, you should go. And it's uh, going to be in uh, the Nashville area, actually in Lebanon, Tennessee, but you'll you'll you know be right in the greater metropolitan area when it comes to you know Nashville and Lebanon. And uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, I think the folks are going to be arriving on Thursday the 9th and then things really get off to a start. A uh, you know, strong program I saw on Friday the 10th and carries over to Saturday the 11th. And you got some great speakers. Vody Bachman's going to be there. Doug Tanapel, of course, Doug uh, Wilson, Douglas Wilson. And we'll be there. We're going to actually have a uh, live podcast and we're going to be joined by George Grant, our friend George will be with us and we're going to be talking about Gnosticism and the sexual revolution. So it's, there's not going to be any shortage of stuff to, to talk about. And uh, we'd love to see you there. Hopefully we'll have some merch. I think Canon Press will be there with some of our books. So it's, it's looking to be a great time. And if you want to learn more about it, go to the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network uh, and uh, find them online and, and uh, you know, register for the conference. Now, another thing, we've got some friends over at the Davenant Institute, and Davenant Hall is a marvelous program that they've established that we'd like you to consider. Um, You know, there are a lot of great podcasts out there, but podcasts can't give you a systematic approach to learning. You know, it's kind of hit and miss. We talk about this. We talk about that. Uh, The folks over at Davenant Hall have a great classical Christian uh, curriculum, and uh, it would be, uh, I think, worth your time to go check it out. We've got a link to Davenant Hall. It's not hard to find. It's Davenant Hall, Davenant, uh, D-A-V-E-N-A-T, or A-N-T, I should say, Hall with a capital H-A-L-L.com. And uh, you can learn about the program there. You can study lots of different things. All the stuff is, uh, all the classes are conducted on Zoom. So it's a seminar style approach and you'll be able to Actually, download the course after you've taken it and keep it and play it again and learn, you know, and reinforce the learning and um, check it out. It's a it's a I, you know, we've looked at it um, when the, those guys came to us and said, hey, you know, would you guys be interested in talking to folks in podcast land uh, about the about what we're doing? We looked at the curriculum. We said, yeah, this looks great. Uh, so go and check out the curriculum. And it seems like it's a. Uh, actually very cost effective. Uh, they actually have a, a certificate program, I think it is, or uh, let's see. Anyway, I, th- I think, yeah, it's a, uh, th- you can actually earn a master's in Protestant letters. That's, that's cool. Anyway, check them out. We'll have a link in the show notes and uh, uh, they're really good with, you know, ancient languages and magisterial uh, reformed teaching and so forth. So anyway, check out Davenant Hall. So, what are we talking about today, Glenn? Uh, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the idea of heroes. And some of this came from reflections I got from Tony Esselin, who was asked to do a, um, a review or an analysis of the new Green Knight movie. 
Oh, wow. Um, he does not seem to have seen it and is disinclined to do so based on what he has learned of it. Right. And I can't I blame him. I was planning on trying to make it there, but um, to catch it before the show today, but I haven't had time to do that. Uh, but I think we can, I think there are enough things to, to talk about. Uh, and what I've read about the film, I think it's worth, worth kind of addressing this issue. Yeah, I, I guess the thing is we can more or less assume that it's a revisionist treatment. I mean, if we take, you know, you know what we see broadly speaking in, in Netflix and Amazon Prime and just, you know, all the stuff that's coming out of Hollywood, we can pretty much assume that uh, all the genders have been changed, <laughs> that, that, that there's e some agenda here <laughs> that's e being promoted. Emasculation e ad nauseum. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> Actually, probably not in this case, but but the, but the problem goes in a different direction. Okay. But, but, but let, let, let's just talk about the concept of hero. Um, I, I'm going to run through a little bit of history on this um, and then take a look at what's happened to heroes in the modern world. Hmm. So uh, actually, if you go back to Homer, uh, right in the prelude to the Iliad, uh, you actually run into the word hero. It talks about how during the Trojan War, because of Achilles' uh, argument with uh, Agamemnon, it sent, quote, many brave souls of heroes down to Hades. Uh. Okay, so, so what, what, what is a hero there? Well, a hero there basically seems to mean essentially a warrior, or at least a good warrior, uh, and particularly one from the upper classes, the ones who uh, go out and fight hand-to-hand -hand in armor and all of that kind of thing, at least as Homer depicts it. Hold, hold um, it right there, little Glenn. We need to we need to make a note here that in the in antiquity, the upper classes were the ones who fought. Right. We don't see yeah. that today. It's a re, the re, it's a reversal. Right. And that was actually you know all the way through the Middle Ages, the definition of a noble was a warrior. At least technically speaking, that's how how they conceived of things. Um, the nobility were the ones who fought. Uh, the lower classes who fought, and there were some who did that as well, tended to be a more lightly armed. Uh, Greek word was a peltast, and they would um, they would fight typically with with slings or or bows or javelins or something like that. Whereas the true heroes, the hoplites, the heavily armed infantrymen, went out and fought it out hand to hand, shield, spear, sword, that kind of thing. Okay. Actually, you even find them throwing rocks occasionally, but that's another matter. But but so so your heroes start off just simply being essentially warriors. Okay, uh, that's what the word originally meant. Now uh, I'm going to skip ahead centuries. Uh, when you get to the Middle Ages, you know I think we can. The concept of a hero is going to is going to. The term isn't going to be used in, in the same way we use it today, but you could refer to the elites, uh, people like Odysseus or Achilles or uh, even Agamemnon or Aeneas or whatever. You could, you could refer to them as heroes, but that would be a modern usage of the word. Uh, the ones who were particularly good, who, who particularly exhibited um, strength on the battlefield. Now, when you get to the Middle Ages, um, warfare has changed. There have been a number of evolutions uh, from Homer's day. But in the Middle Ages, uh, starting roughly around Charlemagne's day, really beginning a little bit before him, uh, the, the elite on the battlefield were cavalry. Um, this really started with Charles Martel after the Battle of Poitiers. He was Charlemagne's grandfather. Charlemagne really sort of codifies this. And from the fact that the warrior classes are now fighting on horseback, which, by the way, involves a great deal of wealth, Actually, this, this deserves a pause for a moment. Um, the, the cost of, in the, in the military, the most expensive thing that you got for your soldier is training. It's not the equipment. So even though as a knight, you would need several horses, you wouldn't ride your war horse to the market, it would kill people. You know, you, you, and you would need several war horses, you would need a riding horse, you need all of these kinds of things, you need your armor, you need your weapons, and so on. Dwarfing all of that was training. Because in Charlemagne's day, in the Carolingian period, it was believed that if you didn't learn the rudiments of fighting from horseback by the time you hit puberty, you wouldn't be able to learn them. 
You know, I, I want to make a, just a quick observation here. Uh, Xenophon and his Economicon, talking about the way, you know, ancient households were ordered. Fascinating section in that dialogue between, you know, Socrates and the head of house that's being addressed in the, you know, in the dialogue is uh, the head of house's uh, sort of description of his weekly routine, which includes training in warfare, martial mm -hmm. discipline. So, you know, when people talk about uh, the oppression uh, that uh, was experienced by people in a household in the past, they never talk about the fact that when it came to defending the house, the guy who put his life on the line was the head of the house. Right. Yeah. Well, it, 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 that's absolutely true, especially in Greece, because in order to be a full citizen, in many ways, you have to have enough money to afford arm, armor and weapons, and you had to fight in the phalanx in the classical period. I mean, you had to fight in the city's phalanx or its defense. In the Middle Ages, this the, the fact that you have to spend so much money training and you've got to start so young created the perfect situation for creating a hereditary caste of nobility, and I'm using the word caste here intentionally, uh, rather than class, um, a, a hereditary caste of warriors who were then identified with the nobility. Um, they were given grants of land to govern so that they could raise money to tra train their children as soldiers, as, as, as knights, uh, a knight being technically a mounted warrior. Now, in French, the word knight is chevalier, from the French word cheval, meaning horse. And from that, we get the concept of chivalry. Right. Okay. So ch chivalry is the code of conduct for your chevalier, for your knights, um, your mounted warriors. And initial, initially, chivalry really involved just what we would describe as the martial virtues. It involved courage. It involved prowess in battle. It involved loyalty, um, you know, duty, honor, honor above all, all of these different kinds of things. It, essentially the same warrior virtues that you will find in any warrior society. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with, with the samurai in Japan uh, the ancient Greek warriors, the, the Roman legionaries, um, in all cases, the martial virtues, and again, the word virtue comes from the Latin word vir, meaning an adult responsible male. Um, these are things that were the initial elements of the code of chivalry. Um, and they typically applied primarily to people in your own warrior band. You didn't necessarily have to apply the code of chivalry to anyone who was, number one, not a warrior, and number two, wasn't on your side. Then the church steps in, and Christianity comes along. There are really two sources here, but Christianity on the one hand and the courtly love tradition uh, coming out of Eleanor Aqu of Aquitaine's court on the other. But, but the church especially steps in and says, you know, no, being a Christian warrior involves more than just this kind of martial virtue. You have to use it for the right ends. A, a Christian warrior has to be a Christian first and a warrior second and use his calling as a warrior to promote justice and righteousness and so on. And that's where you get the idea of chivalry being protection of the weak, protection of women, um, might for right, all of those kinds of ideas. It's really the influence of Christianity there. You know, this is fascinating because, you know, right now we're witnessing this, the collapse of Afghanistan, where there's a lot of stuff online that you can, you know, see that just is very disturbing. But one of the things that uh, someone pointed out to me is that, is that it really is a kind of a survival of the fittest in the sense that you don't see many women or children on these flights out of the, out of Kabul. It's all <laughs> young men who have obviously advantages when it comes to, you know, physical strength and, you know, getting, you know, ahead in line and finding a way onto planes and all that kind of stuff. Um, very, not a whole lot of sh uh, chivalry <laughs> on, mm -hmm. on display. You know, people, yeah. you know, men and women are men going down with the Titanic. That's not what we see. In that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, and the men going down with the Titanic is a chivalric ideal. 
Uh, it's also worth noting, by the way, since we're in Afghanistan at the moment, that what you are seeing with the Taliban going house to house, killing the men, raping the family, selling them into slavery, whatever, that's traditional warfare. That's tribal warfare. That is the way it was pretty much all over the world right? In, in, during war. And that, again, was one of these things that changed with Christianity. You see it in a bit in some other places. You, you've got some similar kinds of ideals in China, but that was, for example, but that was um, in Sun Tzu, for example, but that was pure pragmatism. You don't want to abuse the population because you want them to work for you when you conquer the land. Right. You know, it, it's a different kind of thing. There's a moral dimension to Western concepts of warfare that doesn't really come to full fruition. The ideal is there in the Middle Ages. But interestingly enough, the first army in history that we have that didn't indulge in wide scale looting and rape and so on was the New Model Army during the English Civil War. And that was because they saw themselves very much as God's army. You actually had to give a testimony of conversion to join it. And so they were, they were held to a very high standard of conduct. That's actually the first army in history that didn't do that. Um, but again, it, it's based on these earlier medieval concepts that we see in chivalry, except actually applied more systematically than they ever were in the Middle Ages. You know, one of the things that, you know, uh, I think gives a lot of people who are Christians pause in our time is the idea that you can be a Christian warrior, right? that, that, that the gospel can reform military uh, conduct. And mm -hmm. I embrace that wholeheartedly. But there are a lot of people for whom the idea that, you know, you could be a warrior and a Christian, uh, that almost seems like, like something that's, that those are categories that are mutually exclusive. Yeah, but on the other hand, you know, you go all the way back to Augustine, you've got just war theory. Uh, this was modified um, and further developed by Thomas Aquinas, who placed just war under the broad category of love in the Summa. Yeah, that, that's beautiful because, uh, you know, that's certainly not the way people think about it. <laughs> they, yeah. they don't and put it, that within the framework of love. And it did take Christianity a while to hammer that out. It, and I think in the early days, yeah. they really were reluctant. But of course... In the early days, they were reluctant for a lot of reasons. It wasn't just some kind of pacifist disposition. I mean, you have Jesus recognizing in the soldier with all these virtues faith that Israel did not have, right? And there wasn't the negation of those other virtues. It was actually that, that here is a person who, who, who could be conceived as an oppressor of Israel, um, who actually has more faith than, in, in the God of Israel than he could find in Israel. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a play. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. and along with that, Centurion understands things that the civilians didn't Commanding because of his military experience. That's, that's he understood true. authority. He understood chain of command. He understood all of these kinds of things. Uh, and, and he drew from that the analogy yeah. to Jesus' authority. That, that right, right there, there Glenn. Mm-hmm. I was going to say that point you just hit with analogy. It, it, I mean, I think that's the brilliant Christian insight that there is a genuine analogy of Christ's lordship and commander of things and the military virtues. I'll, I'll, you know, yeah. anyway, Chris, sorry, I didn't yeah. mean to cut you off. No, no, that's fine. I think, you know, Cornelius uh, was uh, highly regarded by his Jewish uh, neighbors. He was appreciated. He, he was known for his generosity. Uh, yeah. But he was also a man you probably didn't mess with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't become a centurion unless you're a man you don't want to mess with. I mean, yeah. it's as simple as that. Yeah. You know, Julius Caesar once said that he would rather lose three tribunes, which are higher level officers, than one centurion. Yeah, it's centurions, you know, obviously the name means 100. You know, he's, he's uh, overseeing 100 men. He's close enough to the ground. Mm -hmm. to be able to know what it takes to win, uh, but mm -hmm. high enough to be able to have a perspective of the whole. And mm -hmm. consequently, you know, uh, just by his position, he's in a very advantageous spot to be in touch with kind of the upper and the lower parts of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And it, it, so and it in is, any event, okay. Yeah, go on. Well, I was going to say, it is also interesting here. I mean, this really, I mean, just bursts open. Uh, I mean, something I think that's ever relevant um, to, to our current situation. And it's the way in which Christianity does place within this imperial situation that grows in the West is the linkage of Christianity with, with empire at a given point. These, these alterations of virtue, like you're talking even with chivalry, that would have been inconceivable apart from that, that linkage. And, and the way in which that, I think, is becoming severed, and we're actually we're, we're returning to a more barbaric sense of power, which um, which I think is raw and, and uh, misdirected. But anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Now, all of this, you know, these ideas of martial virtues, but martial virtues that are then extended to courtesy from the word for court, proper behavior at court, courtesy, uh, uh, honor, uh care for the, the weak, the poor, all that, all these, these virtues, um, really, in a lot of ways, the idea of chivalry sums up most of the ideals of, uh, of medieval society, how you should and should not behave, all of those kinds of things are wrapped up in there. And it's no accident, then, that when you read um, Tolkien, when you read Lewis, who were so steeped in medieval literature, you get echoes of these virtues are actually personifications in a lot of ways of these virtues in their writing. So, for example, the first time I read The Lord of the Rings way back when I was uh, entering my freshman year in college, the thing that I got out of it, I walked away saying, okay, now for the first time, I really understand the idea of lordship and what right. that means. And, and by analogy, uh, you know, the authority that Jesus had, because I saw it in Aragorn. Right. And the, and the thing about Aragorn's yeah. character, you look at him, he knows who he is. He knows that he is the heir of the kings of Gondor. He is the rightful king. And um, it, it is, in essence, it has it is his destiny or no one's to bring the kingdom back. And he embraces this and he pursues this. He is not always sure of himself. Um, he is concerned about making mistakes. He knows what the stakes are, all of these kinds of things. But he recognizes who he is. He acts with honor. He acts with authority always. And but, also, but also with humility, as Strider, as the ranger. Yeah, he cares about people. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about his conversations with, like, Sam Gamgee or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Barleyman Butterbur. Now, mm. there's a little bit of antagonism between Barley and Butterbur and Strider, but yeah. it's because uh, Aragorn knows who he is and Barleyman doesn't know who he mm. is. But think about, you know, even this idea of the king being a healer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he demonstrates his kingly character by tending to the wounded, by helping people who are hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, another one that I would like to point out that is emphatically not a pagan virtue is humility. Aragorn, when you first meet him, is, given who he is, he is absolutely humble. He's traveling around in the wilderness, sleeping uh, rough, uh, taking protecting the region from all kinds of monsters and things like that while people are... Uh, treating him with contempt, they're 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 afraid of him. Yeah. They you know they don't. Th this this is this is a kind of humility in action. So okay. he is humble, but he also recognizes his authority, and when it's appropriate, he takes it and moves forward. You know, the, this is an ideal. The, these are ideals and these are virtues that, from the perspective, if you understand medieval concepts of chivalry, all of this makes perfect sense, mm -hmm. and. For that reason, it is terribly interesting what Peter Jackson does to him, <laughs> not with him, to him. Yeah. Um, now, he, you know, he did not want to portray Aragorn as he was in the book mm. because he said, you know, when, when the person, you know, you don't want a person who says, yeah, I'm the rightful king and I'm going to go take it because the, we've seen this too often, he says. So what does he do? He makes... Aragorn uncertain, he makes him, 
well, in a lot of ways, um, a, a weak, fearful, um, afraid of his destiny, afraid of becoming who he actually is, you know, all of these kinds of things. Um, and he also has Aragorn acting in emphatically unchivalrous ways. So, for example, in the book, he beheads the mouth of Sauron at a parley. You don't do that. <laughs> so that happened in the movie, but not in the book. You're movie, but not in the book, right? Yeah, I've not, book. I've not seen, I've not seen the movie. Fortunately, I've not had my mind polluted. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and um, you know, but th- there's this also this relationship. I mean, I think what you have with comparing the book with with Jackson's interpretation is is you have the the, the kind of tension that this kind of interpretation he wants to bring to make it more plausible to the kind of world he's trying to show the film in um, it is this compromise um, on the transcendent and the 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 way in which the the you know, uh, to use literary language, the transcendental signified the way in which the ultimate reference orders things like, like our destiny and our identity in this is very, very different than this this lack of certainty of identity that a modern would have because they don't they don't know what it's ground it, it's grounded either in some kind of fragile imminent or in some kind of construct and and so you 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 are constantly it, it's it's almost like it's always deferred. You know, it, it, it's always, it's, it's never embraced. It's always deferred unless finally, you know, it, some, something forces it to happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, uh, another example that I would pick that's kind of obvious is Faramir. Yeah. You know, Faramir in the book says he doesn't know what weapon it is, but he wouldn't pick it up even if he found it on the side of the road. Well, in this, in the movie, because he's got daddy issues, um, he tries, he tries to seize, he, he tries to seize the ring, bring it back to Gondor, and all that. And only, in a rather way that it seems a little irrational, he realizes that this is a mistake and sends Frodo on his way. Why? Well, because Jackson said, you know, we, we're spending all the time building up how evil the ring is, and then it's really impossible to imagine. Faramir coming along and just turning it away, rejecting it. Because if it is so powerful and so corrupting, how is that possible? Well, the way it's possible is that virtue is stronger than evil. Yeah. Right. And in the modern world, people don't understand that, that it is possible to genuinely be an honorable, noble character, to have virtue that is greater than the temptations to evil. They cannot imagine a situation in which something like that would be the case. And, you know, their argument is if the ring is so powerful and so corrupting, how could Faramir do this? Do you think that Tolkien didn't think of that himself? Right. Yeah. Well, you think about all the characters who reject the ring, you know, mm-hmm. beginning with Gandalf and uh, Bombadil yeah, and, and, and uh, Aragorn. You know, Aragorn and Elrod and Faramir and Galadriel, like you said, uh, all of the best characters in the book. And by the way, all these characters um, honor the weaker people or the weaker characters in this in in their world i mean they 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 don't they don't lord it over frodo or sam in fact often you see a kind of admiration by the higher characters when they recognize something noble in the in the weaker characters i mean physically right. weaker or socially weaker or whatever yeah you yeah. have a you have a thread going on there um you know, metaphysically, that lordship and and dominance and 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 genuine exercise of it is something that is that that really fo- fosters and cultivates all the way down to the lowest of creatures, and it does so because because there is, I think, um, s- spread throughout the the work. The, the genuine gift character of everything there that it, that it is mm-hmm. is the source's um, responsibility as giving this gift to actually cultivate it in everything ordered that way does it as well I mean that that's the thing there isn't there isn't a small thing here um, that is instrumental to power in this situation that power needs in order to be powerful 
true power is such mm-hmm. that it it is able to not be to not envy the gift of the little thing, but actually to to love and and, and cherish it. And I think that that really is is a theological vision that you know kind of uh, completely you know encapsulates mm-hmm. the Christian worldview. Yeah, I think I think there are certain things that are beautiful that can only be. I guess, uh, cultivated at the lowest levels, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so there are certain things that we see in, say, Sam, that cannot be expressed or embodied by any other character in the book. There's something beautiful about Sam, um, his loyalty, his concern with, like, build the pony, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. You know, and and like, let's talk about Bill the Pony. I was just listening to my to to you know the audio book of Lord of the Rings with my wife on our way back from Moscow the other day, and so here's Gandalf, you know, uh, addressing Sam about the pony because they're at the gates of Moria. They can't take the pony in. You know, Sam is just you know he's beside himself. He's a, he knows that this pony is going to be eaten by wolves if they let him go and then Gandalf Gandalf doesn't say stupid Sam why do you care about a pony no what Gandalf does is he actually goes up to the pony and does something that we learn actually later in the story does lead to the 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 horse's salvation you know he he finds his way back to I think it was Elrod, maybe it was Bombadil. I can't remember particularly the specifics, but but anyway, uh, Gandalf doesn't doesn't despise Sam's concerns. He takes them seriously. Well, you know, and the, the word that I want to use here for all of this is generosity, um, in the sense of, of a genuine generosity of spirit. That the people who have power, the people who have authority. Um, th- these people know who they are. They don't have to prove anything. They don't have to lord it over anyone. And instead, they extend honor to pretty much everybody. And everybody, and in the case of the horse, everything to, to, right. to, to build. You know, so so this again, this idea of, gen- I would describe it as generosity of spirit rather than generosity in terms of cash. But that concept, again, is an ideal that you see in medieval chivalry. Well, in, and actually appreciate that in many ways. And notice in comparison to, to today, I mean, just how secure identity is. I mean, and, and I think that that's one of the, one of the key elements. I mean, it's identity is so fragile now because it's so been, you know, unmoored from any true, true transcendence and thus any true eminence. So it has to be secured through structures of power that affirm the unrealities we tend to associate with our identities now because they have been disconnected. Where here, you don't have that. What you, you're, you, the, any insecurity that may arise would be not living up to the virtues of the kind of identity we have. That's very different. It's a different kind of um, wrestling with reality. And, and I, just, I think that really speaks volumes through, through Tolkien's work from what I remember, is, is how different that is. You're, you're not hearing, you know, you may have people in a sense of discovery of what their place is in the whole. I mean, that, that, that's human life in many ways. But that's very different than bearing the burden of having to construct it, which I think is, it was, is the problem um, we see in so, much, so many things today. Right. And our identities are so fragile because they're constructed. That's right. Um, and we know that they're they, we know that they're really unmoored from reality. You know. Yeah. Now it's worth noting Tolkien was presenting these people not as perfect, but as ideals. Yeah. And both of them, actually, in an interesting way, they work together. Um, you know. So Aragorn is, in many ways, an ideal. He he is a person that you could aspire to be like. But even Aragorn has his failings. Even he ha- is facing doubt and uncertainty and, and struggles with knowing the right thing to do and all of that, that kind of thing. Then we go to people like George R. R. Martin. <laughs> who I, will use, I, I will use on my way to the Green Knight as a foil here. 
<laughs> um, Martin looks at the Lord of the Rings and says, all of these people who actually live out the virtues that they claim to, to live by, that actually do it, none of this is realistic. People in reality are hopelessly corrupt, uh, and I'm going to portray them in my fantasy the way they really are. Now, I would argue from Tolkien's perspective, uh, what he would call fairy rather than fantasy, um, that's missing the point. We know the way the world is. Um, the, the fairy story is intended to bring you beyond just sort of the mundane and, and the things around you. Now, that's really, I would argue, perhaps the difference between Tolkien's concept of fairy and our concept of fantasy. Uh, Martin thinks that, that, that it's, it's far better to depict the world in all of its ugliness and stuff like that rather than actually depicting people who are truly heroic. Hmm or chivalric, or who live according to their virtues, or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, one of the things that I wonder about with a person like Martin, and there are many others who have that same approach to things, the thing I wonder about is uh, what their motives are. Um, I can't say, uh, but mm -hmm. I have my suspicions. I'm a human being, <laughs> and consequently, <laughs> they're human beings, and I have, a part, yeah, I have things in myself that I that I, I know are unworthy, uh, and I suspect that uh, they uh, have those same unworthy, you know, aspects or sort of character flaws. Um, are they trying to excuse themselves? Are they trying to smear uh, the beautiful so that they can look relatively better in comparison? You know, one of the things I learned, I saw years ago, it fascinated me and appalled me. I've worked with a lot of kids who are troubled, particularly boys. And one of the things that uh, I saw when I would visit them in the institutions that they uh, had been incarcerated in is, is that the, the, uh, they couldn't bear living with white walls. Now, let me go on to explain what I mean. They would, they would desecrate them by smearing feces on them. I saw this again and again and again, and I wondered, what is going on with this? My conviction is, I can't prove this, we're not in the world of you know, empirical, <laughs> sort of sociological yeah. studies. We're just, I'm just <laughs> sort of, what is going on with this? Yeah. My, my guess is that they cannot bear purity because they are impure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I suspect you're, you're onto something there and perhaps with Martin as well. And, and the interesting thing is, now, now we're going to get to the Green Knight. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing is, if you read the story of the Green Knight, Gawain is the uh, is a paragon of knightly virtues. And, um, you know, he more or less succeeds in the test that he is confronted with. He has a minor flaw at the end, which he considers a, a real uh, black mark on his honor. Um, really pretty minor, all things considered. But the way they read it, they took the whole thing and inverted it so that Gawain is actually the epitome of everything a knight is not supposed to be. <laughs> He's got all of the vices, fails at pretty much everything. Um, in terms of how he is supposed to behave. Um, and then in the end, although they don't say this directly, he actually gets his head chopped off. That's sort of the implication. <laughs> Whereas in the story, it ends very, very differently. And, you know, when you talk to the director, he's talking about, you know, interrogating the subtexts of the original poem and, you know, all of this kind of language, <laughs> which is just another way of saying that he's rewriting it. Yeah, and he's right. actually, he is actually desecrating yeah. the story. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know a better word than desecrate here. He's polluting it. Yeah. He's defiling it. Now, this yeah. is what Tony Eslin has to say. <laughs> or, yeah. or to, now, you know, to use Joseph Pieper's language, he's raping it. I mean, that's, that's sort of what, if you want to be honest, that's, you know, that's really what's going on there. Yeah. Right. Well, Tony Esselin uh, on Facebook, um, I'm going to read something that he wrote 
about this. And this was really the thing that got me thinking about this topic. Uh, on August 6th, um, he does a word of the day. It's gold. I'm not going to get into the gold part of this. Uh, but he says, I've been asked to review the current film, The Green Knight, which by all accounts is a pretty sick and malevolent travesty of that splendid medieval poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. The poem is a masterpiece of world literature, and at that is only the author's second best. His absolute best is Pearl, which in my view for its technical virtuosity is the most magnificent narrative poem in English. It is also deeply moving, humane, and cheerfully consoling while being steeped in the theology of salvation, as is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. We don't know the author's name because, I guess, he didn't see fit to make sure that people knew it. He's as great a poem in his vein as Chaucer is in his. Hmm. What I've picked up about the movie, and this is where, where it gets interesting, what I've picked up about the movie confirms my suspicion that Hollywood is effectively dead. You would do better to ask Helen Keller to compose a symphony than to ask Hollywood to produce a single film in praise of the gentleness, the moral courage, the purity, and the simple religious devotion of Sir Gawain, the unlikely hero in the medieval poem. It isn't that the people in Hollywood don't like Gawain's virtues as the poet portrays them. It's that they simply do not understand them or do not know that they exist. Everything in their world is dark, gloomy, cynical, and mirthless. They paint with a palette ranging from gray through black to some infernal color that is darker than black and has no name. They have the anti-Midas touch. All the gold they handle turns to soot. Okay. Now, there's actually, there's actually one more paragraph I'd like to read, but I want to pause there for a moment. I think that this is, I think he's exactly right here that Hollywood really has, well, and it's not just Hollywood. I would say the culture itself really doesn't, understand or have a category or believe in the possibility of genuine virtue. Yeah. They don't believe that there is a possibility for a character to be genuinely chivalric, genuinely heroic. They all have to be fundamentally flawed on a really deep level. I mean, even I would argue Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings is when you, when you first see him in, uh, in uh, the house of Elrond in the fellowship of the ring and he has a conversation with Arwen. He's just he's just uh, really angsty about the fact that his his ancestor failed. Yeah, you know? and, and I mean, what you what you really have going on here is is a distortion of pure spiritual beauty, um, mm -hmm. flowing, and therefore ha being uh, in human beings through virtue being conformable to it. I mean, you can have a Platonic reading of that. Christians who 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 early on saw the value in that because it was consonant with truth, beauty, and goodness being at the heart of, of, of the transcendent source of everything God, right, is such that there is a purification, I mean, we call it holiness and godliness, that, that you know, that, that virtue cultivation gives us a, a, a an antenna for this, this kind of spiritual beauty for which I think contemporary society um, shrieks before because it's incongruity with that. It, it sees that as something to, to repulse, to, to, that puts a limit on its, its center or its agenda or its wills and wants that are unrefined and, and really um, gloat in the flesh, if you will. Um, you could use the biblical terminology of this is, this is pure flesh um, rebellion against um, the true beauty of true spirituality. And, and I think that's what you have going on here, that this gross obsession with indulgence um, that, that represents you know, the heroic poet right the one who's drunk all the time you know sean penn if you will <laughs> you know um here's somebody who can barely utter a, a a coherent sentence but they're seen as some kind of political genius who associates with you know political uh you know profound figures yeah, which, which yeah this you know, i think this i think this brings up uh kind of a paradox there is a kind of self I guess, um, well, atonement that occurs when a person uh, is able to condemn the tradition or the truths that condemn them, and then they can embrace 
some kind yeah. of uh, virtue that they can signal to the world. This is, you know, pen. Uh, it doesn't have any sort of, uh, you know, sort of connection to reality. I mean, this is a guy who thought Venezuela was like uh, heaven on earth or something, you know, that, it, that yeah. we should yeah. all follow the pattern of, uh, that we find yeah. in, in that sort of failed state. You know, there's another irony here, too. The same yeah. people are the people who will argue that humanity is basically good. Humanity is basically good, and yet they're incapable of imagining a good person. Right, right, yeah. right. Or, or at least on a heroic level. Well, uh, that, that paradox works in the other direction. You know, here we are, uh, and I know Tol this is true for Tolkien and, and Lewis and other Christians. We believe that human beings are fallen. And that, mm -hmm. and that may be the secret to why we can portray a character like Aragorn if we, you know, hold up Tolkien as a Christian exemplar of good writing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the you know the point here, I guess, is that the culture has completely lost any concept of virtue. We've talked about the implications of this for the idea of liberty. If you don't have virtue, you can't have liberty. Um, it, uh, according to the founders, you can't have a republic either. It's worth noting the direction we're heading. But it also affects our art. And, you know, in particular for me, uh, where I see this most pointedly is even in our fantasies, we cannot imagine goodness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, and, and uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like, oh, go on, Tom. No, I was just saying, it, well, my, my point, I, it may be better to come in at a different point. So keep keep going with your role, and I, I'll bring it in when, when I think it, it fits. But it's, well, it's something related to lack of virtue cultivation. <laughs> yeah. I, actually, what I'm, what I'm going to do is, is uh, shift directions a little bit. I want to read Tony's next paragraph about the Middle Ages because I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, okay. Okay, well, maybe I'll get this in. Maybe I'll get this in real quick. One, one of the other areas sure. you mentioned, the areas is missing. But one of the other areas you see, and I know there are other other causes going on here. But one of the things I really see in a, in a in a more mainstream way is the increasing impatience of. I mean, you're seeing fights break out in airports and restaurants. But this this exactly when you mentioned that last point that you can't have a republic without the virtues. You can't have general civility and communication without virtue because passions start to run un, unguided and, and not directed. And so you, you, you really, when you break down all of these things, the transcendent reference, the orientation towards it grounded in godliness, holiness, and virtue development, th then what you end up with is the, the rawest form of human expression you can have which is it, it undermines us. It takes away from the dignity, even as fallen creatures being made in the image of God. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's another good extension of it, that, that it extends way beyond um, just the political or the cultural. It extends even into our dealings with each other. Each other, yeah. Yeah. So um, – just because I'd like to, I'd like to finish this uh, this section from Tony. I'm going to read his next paragraph uh, or two here. This is his um, his discussion of the Middle Ages in medieval culture. Of course, they, the people in Hollywood, believe that the age that produced the poem was dark. Strange that. The medieval mood before the Black Plague, and even in many ways after that event, late in the period, 1348, is quite the opposite of dark. Imagine Gothic cathedrals before the soot of the Industrial Revolution. They were perfect jewel boxes of light. Henry Adams, no Christian apologist, saw it and appreciated it. Everywhere you went in Europe, people were outdoors in the unusually warm weather. Foot, uh, note from me, the medieval period was warmer than our current climate. Okay. Uh, people were outdoors during the unusually warm weather, doing things, singing, fighting, going on a pilgrimage, selling their wares, putting on sprawling series of plays on portable stages for the Corpus Christi Tridium, even defending theological pop propositions for the baccalaureate at Paris or Oxford. Love poetry is everywhere, from the soaring theological art of Dante to the intense lyrics of the Provencal troubadours to the merry bawdry of tinkers and peddler songs, like the English one that begins as I translate it, I have a magic sausage. 
Body is what they used to call that. <laughs> there is a difference between body and raunchy. Um, it, it, it's worth noting that it isn't only the the tinkers and peddlers that do this. There were a number of high churchmen, known as the well, Arctic poets, who wrote well the Carmina Burana, which is a celebration of uh, wine, women, and song. Um, uh, there's a thing called the Arch Poet's Confession that has a section that someone translated into English. And by the way, it rhymes in Latin too, although the rhymes are different. Translated this this one small section of this very long poem as, in an alehouse for to die is my resolution. Let wine to my lips be nigh at life's dissolution. That will make the angels cry with glad elocution. Grant this drunkard God on high grace and absolution. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of stuff was around. I mean, these, these, but... Anyway, um, I drink to that, except I drank it all already. But there is, there's room for everything if it's ordered the right way. <laughs> Continuing on um, with Tony, international trade brings spices and silks to the drab old British Isles. And let's not even talk about Florence and Venice. Look at the paintings. Look at the stained glass windows. Look at the illuminated manuscripts. Read the songs. Sing the carols. It was not a glum and bitter time. Ours is that. We don't even reach the level of iron pyrite. If the age of Mark Twain was gilded, what the heck is ours when we don't even build town halls or libraries that are worth a damn? If the age that gave us Scott Joplin and Ricard Strauss and Rodin and Puccini was gilded, and in many respects it was, what on earth should we call this age when we can't even appreciate a beautiful poem from the past but have to smear it with our own slime? Yeah, it definitely that definitely... Uh is reflected in my earlier comments about these disturbed boys who couldn't bear a white wall. Right. And, and that, you know, that, that made me, I was going to read this in any event, but after your comment, I thought I'd very definitely have to read it. Um, this is by the way, Tony Esselin, I wish I could write half as well as he does. <laughs> yeah. You know, the guy, the guy's a brilliant thinker and an absolutely brilliant writer. Yeah. And I mean, this yeah. is just for a quick Facebook post. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a fast writer too. I was. I remember talking mm -hmm. with Jim Kushner over at Touchstone. He's the senior editor there, and in house, you know, Tony is one of the senior editors there. In house, they refer to him as the Esselin because they're not they're not able to sort of uh, comprehend how one man could produce so much stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Yeah. So it it it, it is. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but at any rate, you know, again, I don't think it's an accident that people with Tolkien and Lewis's aesthetic sense understood, were drawn to, and really appreciated the Middle Ages on all kinds of different levels. Yeah. Um, they didn't. They they weren't romantics in the in the sense that they created an idealized golden age that never really existed. They were romantics in one sense, but certainly not in that. Um, they had, I would describe them as having romantic tendencies, perhaps, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't push it much further than that. But they understood and they appreciated the goodness, the truth, and the beauty that the Middle Ages aspired to. It never really hit it, but Golden Ages never exist. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's, again, not surprising, I think, that these guys, above all, given not only their scholarly interests, but also their temperament, would find the value in what's there. Right. right. Well, and it's interesting in, in you know, academic world and in, in the theological sciences, those that still um, want to hold to confessional, consistent Christianity, I'm talking Protestant as well as anyone, but Protestants especially, mm -hmm. realize that if you cannot go back to that minefield, I mean, this is something R Richard Muller will talk about, the minefield of the Middle Ages, you get your Protestant Christianity fundamentally wrong. Um, and I think even Doug Wilson wrote a book on kind of the medieval Protestant, if you will, or the, or the um, you know, something along those lines. I think you were reading that recently, Glenn. Is that correct? It was something along those lines. Or, yeah, uh, no, I, that was me. It might have been Chris. Well, okay, I know yeah. he's got a book in, entitled Our, uh, Angels in the Architecture, which he, in which he's talking about yeah. sort of the aesthetic uh, you the, know, the, sort of uh, inheritance that we have from the medieval world. 
And he, he is, I think, appreciating something that we're beginning to appreciate more and more is that the, the continuity rather than the discontinuity. Um, you know, we spent so much time on the discontinuities that, we, that we, we kind of lost the continuities. And it's those continuities that are, I think, of utmost significance. And Lewis caught on to that in his own way, even though he may not be where we are as, uh, as reformed in, in certain emphases. Nevertheless, I think he's right on target, and we have to digest that the right way. Right. Right. And in fact, if you, one of the great Reformation historians of the 20th century uh, was Heiko Obermann. And the entire Obermann thesis is that all of the Reformation ideas have their roots in the Middle Ages. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and Steinmetz, uh, one of his students, yeah, uh, actually, yeah. he he managed to do something Heiko never managed to pull off. When he found the connection to Calvin, hmm. and it comes <laughs> through Martin Bootser. Hmm. So gotcha. anyway, but that's yeah. So um, I I find, like I said, you know, for me, this entire topic opens up not just in the issue of the appreciation of the Middle Ages, which I really do think have a lot to offer us. But it also, I think, provides an interesting window on our own culture and our, our, our culture's inability to recognize uh, virtue, to recognize goodness, to recognize beauty, to recognize honor, to recognize any of these kinds of things. We've essentially become Calvinists without God. Um, <laughs> it's the word that all we see and all we celebrate is depravity. Yeah. And you know, one of the one of the things I'd like to kind of just t t touch on quickly before we, you know, kind of uh, wrap things up. Um, you know, the, when we think about the heroic, which is what we're talking about, mm -hmm. yeah, that was the place we where we, you know, that's where we started. Um, something that maybe we can come back to is different understandings of the heroic. You know, there there's the Homeric sort of understanding of the heroic, which we in which we see someone like Achilles, who's petulant and self-absorbed and really concerned with how, how, how he looks is, you know, the honor <laughs> that's accorded to him. And then, uh, the other thing about Achilles is he is really, really good at slaughtering people. <laughs> 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 but uh, that we have other kinds of, uh, we have other understandings of the heroic that come later. I think the Roman understanding is different. Certainly, uh, you've already sort of uh, sort of brought to the surface the way that medieval thinkers, with the, the understanding of chivalry, you know, thought about thought about this. You know, when I think about this, I, I can't help but think about baseball because uh, the, the the Boston Red Sox back in the early two thousands had a great team that won a couple of World Series, and they had some very different characters on that team. One of those characters, uh, you know, was Jason Veritek. Uh, and the other uh, guy that I'm thinking about is David. Uh, oh, I'm just drawing a blank. He was the uh, the designated hitter for the Red Sox. Uh, David Ortiz. David Ortiz. When David Ortiz, I, th I think of David Ortiz as sort of a, an expression of the Homeric hero. And I think of Jason Veritek as an expression of the, Ro of the Roman understanding of heroism. So, like when when David uh, Ortiz would hit a home run, there was no one who admired his home run more than him. <laughs> he would stand there and watch it soar over the wall. You know, he was just wow. Jason Veritek, when he'd hit a home run, he was almost embarrassed. He would, his head would go down, and he would run the bases as fast as he possibly could, and re would refuse to acknowledge the crowd when they cheered for him. He was just sort of like the Roman understanding is I'm just doing my job. I did my duty. Yeah. I hit a home run. Stop yeah, praising sure. me. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I had to throw that in because whenever the subject of heroism comes up, I think of those two characters, David Ortiz and, and Jason Veritek, <laughs> and how they kind of embody those two different ideals. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. What a way to end well, the show. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've just about finished what, what, I mean, there's obviously more wrinkles and details we could pull in, but I, I got through the stuff I'd intended to get through, so I'm good. <laughs> so why don't we land this plane? Did you see that? that Look, meme after, that, that, after that <laughs> meme, I don't think I can even I can end the show the same way anymore. <laughs> that was Time great. to bring this baby in for a landing. <laughs>
<laughs> that was a fun meme. Anyway, uh, we should bring this plane in for a landing. Is there anything else you want to say, Tom, as we wrap up? No, I mean, a lot of fascinating things, but we've got, God willing, plenty of shows to return to them. So, so it's right. a great, right. great conversation. And, you know, as I think about this, I can't help but have uh, the saying of Gypsy Rose Lee come to mind. <laughs> Always leave them wanting more. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what we'll do. We'll leave you wanting more of the show because that'll help you tune in next time. But, uh, hey, as I wrap up, I do want to note one of the things that, uh, you know, we really do appreciate is the fact that people give us, uh, you know, good ratings on on iTunes and stuff like that. There have been a number of ratings that have been uh, posted here recently. There have been people who have given us uh, gifts Uh, financial gifts through our website and through memberships in the Fight, Laugh, Feast network and so forth. And we're grateful for those things. And um, so, you know, it's just as marvelous to see how people enjoy the show. And we really uh, are grateful that people like the show. So thank you for for all the ways that you let us know that. Anyway, that's enough for now. Bye-bye.